Hi everybody and welcome to another episode of Quilt Stories. Today I'm absolutely honoured to have my really good friend Jenny Barker talking about one of her quilts that uh, has not only blown my mind but anybody that's seen it has just been really amazed and when you hear the story behind it and how it was made you're just going to be absolutely fascinated. So welcome Jenny. Isn't a nice way of breaking a a COVID-19 isolation period. I know, it's been really dreadful and it's, it's lovely that we can communicate like this. This is great. So I'm going to screen share and I'd like Jenny to start by telling us the story behind the quilt. 2013, President Morsi had been in power for a year or so in Egypt, in Cairo, and the Egyptians decided they wanted to get rid of him, particularly the army. And so they fairly cleverly manipulated the people and staged a coup. And Morsi was deposed and a group of his followers occupied two major squares in Cairo. And one of them was, was known as, generally known as Rubber or Rubber Square. They occupied the square and refused to move. They actually occupied quite peacefully most of the time. They, they camped there, they camped under blue tarpaulins. You can see one in the background of that picture strapped to a wooden frame. And they slept there and they showered in nearby restaurant bathrooms and they were fed by locals and, and they, they stayed for months. Then one night, Bob and I, we were back in Australia at this time. Bob had been ambassador there and we got to know Egypt very well had lots of good friends there. And we were lying in bed at night and Bob got a text from a friend saying, we can hear shooting from Al Rubber Square. And so we turned on Twitter and Twitter is amazing when something is actually happening and current. And Bob was reading on his iPad, I was reading on my phone. He was reading bits of the Arabic and I was reading all the English because I don't read Arabic well. There was a tweet that came across about an hour into the time when they'd started shooting saying, please, could you write your phone numbers on your arms because we can't identify the body. And it just filled me with absolute horror that they didn't know who people were. A lot of the demonstrators didn't carry ID and they didn't want families for not knowing what had happened if they suddenly disappeared because the Egyptians had come in, they had closed off all the entrances to the square with tanks that morning and they had sent snipers up into buildings and they had simply opened fire on the demonstrators and people couldn't escape, they were trapped in this square and my friend Mossab al Shami, who had gone in with his brother and a couple of friends that morning, they were all photojournalists trained at the American University of Cairo. And they'd gone in just to get some nice string of stories. None of them had full time jobs. They were hoping to find some human interest stories about demonstrators, how long they'd been camped there, what they were eating, did they go home and to their mothers to have a home cooked meal occasionally, or how were they? How were they managing? And so they thought that would be a good little story to sell to an international newspaper. And so they were in there and they were trapped too. And Mossab started taking photographs. One of his friends was killed. His brother was shot in the eye and he survived, but he, he's blind in one eye. Mossab started taking photographs until someone was shot beside him and then someone on the other side of him. And he realized they were aiming at his camera. They could see the journalist's long lens on the camera. So he slipped out he managed to get out he got out through through a building out through the back of the building and went to mosques and started filming in mosques so that's the basic story of this image and he took this photograph of a man who has just seen his friend shot it's a very very powerful image um this is Mossad this is Mossad he was 23 at the time that was about the time that he took this photograph he was out of university working but working as a stringer occasionally and not not regularly and um just a boy um i'd like to take a moment to talk about the use of someone else's photograph as inspiration because i know that you feel very strongly about copyright and um, yeah yeah it was problematic for me because usually i make portraits of people and I make very detailed portraits of people, but I do it with my own photographs and with people I know. And it's one of my private and personal rules. Those, those rules that give everyone the most problems because you set yourself a standard. Yes. So 
part of the inspiration is um, a carpet or a rug was part of it's your It's a pattern which is used all over the Middle East. It's slightly elongated, a bit more diamond than square. I wanted to use the square because the half square triangle is something that quilters all over the world use. Maybe not Lisa Walton, but I'm sure you've done it at times. I have. But <laughs> it's such a commonly known image to use a half square triangle on point. And it's very common in Arab work, in any Arab weaving. It's used on horse rugs and camel blankets and shoulder bags and saddle bags, all sorts of things use this pattern. And I knew that in using this and an image of a demonstrator, I was actually using something that could be seen as upright, a civil war in Syria, an uprising in Lebanon or in Sudan, and it could be identified immediately with the Arab world to anyone who knew the Arab world, because that's a pattern that, that half square triangle on point is just a very common pattern. And here is uh, when you're starting to lay it out a little bit. No, that was oh. at the very, very end. Oh, okay. And I, at the end, I had made enough triangles. I went nearly demented making these things. There were so many triangles to fill the sky. Halfway through, I started adding double size ones as well, because... I wanted it to be more chaotic than it was coming out. It was coming out very regular. And I wanted it to be a slightly chaotic image. So I used some that were like four triangles, but in one piece and started putting them up. And I wasn't going to make triangles to go behind where the body would, where the figure would go. I didn't want to have to make all those extra triangles and then cover them up and cut them away. So I left a gap. And I discovered when I was putting it together that that created a big problem, laying it down on the table. How do you know that your lines are now square, that things are going to line up square behind the figure? And to me, that mattered because I didn't want them to be tilting sideways in or out or skewed. So I actually had to make support pieces that joined the strips. Ah, oh, right. Okay. And sew them in place. So the webbing was strong and square. So all the lines looked as if they connected because what goes behind something has to come out the other side in the right place. If it's wrong, and obviously wrong, or doing this or doing that, then it's actually not going to work because it's going to look as if the figure is lying in the sky instead of in front of it. Okay. Yeah. When you do landscape work, you have to think of it. Because okay. if a line of a sunset goes behind a person, the same line has to come out the other side of their head. Good. I did wonder when, when I got this photo and I thought, hmm, not quite sure what that means. So... Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Fruity. But no, that's a, a really valid point. That's great. Okay, so um, here we have um, some of your background. And yes. something blue is happening here. Yeah, the blue was the tarpaulin. In the photograph, it was there. And I actually loved the balance of that deep, intense blue. It was refreshing somehow. It looked like water or sky reflected or something like this. It was actually a tarpaulin that was draped over some boxes that they were climbing under to sleep at night. It wasn't properly mounted, it wasn't a tent. They were sleeping on what was basically an asphalt road surface. So it wasn't something they could peg a guy rope into, but they, they all had tarpaulins for shelter at night. It was, it was July, it was hot, so they weren't cold, but you sometimes got a dew at night, which was unpleasant if you got damp when you were sleeping. Okay. But I like the way it was reflecting the fire also at the front of the tarpaulin. Later, when you look at it, you'll see there's a purplish reflection where it's picking up the colours of the flames as the, the square around them was burning and all the wooden boxes in the square were burning. And um, I like the colour, I like the, the reality of it. And I thought it would be rather fun. I made that first just to get my hand back in. And it looks really rough here because when you do this applique, I'm doing applique which is rough, it's raw edged, it's machine sewn. I'm not a hand stitcher and I don't needle turn things. Okay, um, I'd like to talk about a little bit just about the process. Um, I can see, um, I guess it's freezer paper. Um, I can see yes. a, a sketch. It's not freezer paper. It's what you're seeing in the background there rolled up bits of wonder under so it's the fusible webbing that I use. You draw onto a 
a large piece just of I draw onto a background piece of fabric. I draw, I draw first, I trace the photograph and I trace all the lightest bits and then I trace all the darkest bits. And then I look at anywhere where I can see a value difference that is not outlined in some way. And I also care about color differences because I wanted that fire reflection to be obvious. If I did it just as value, it wouldn't have shown, it wouldn't have been obvious. Mm -hmm. So I also wanted color differences. So I basically outlined every different colour or value I could see with the idea that each was going to be a different piece of fabric. And I did that on an A4 photograph. I'd blown the photograph up, printed at A4. And I also later blew up the face as A4 and did that separately so I had more detail on the face. But we've got photos of that coming up soon too, yep. Yes, good. Then I have it photocopied, so it's big, the size I want it to be. I trace that onto a background fabric and here I've just used a piece of white cotton. And if you peer carefully, you can just see my lines that I'm working from. And I start cutting out the shapes that I want and ironing them down. So the iron's sitting there on my table. Beautifully colour coordinated, I must add. Yeah, I must admit that was not intentional, but you, I now notice I also have a colour coordinated mug and a bowl and a pincushion. <laughs> Good to know. So here we have, and this is giving you some indication of the size as well. I mean, it's a, a mammoth quilt. So um, just this That's one. That's one top hold and yes. Yeah, is, is great. And I can see the purple. So yeah, the red reflections coming through. And so this is the finished tarpaulin piece. Just about. It's not really finished until it's sewn down and quilted. Yeah. Once I've got it ironed down, I actually sew around every single piece. One of my personal private rules is that I don't glue anything unless it's stitched, because to me, to be a quilt, it needs to be sewn down. So mm. that's something I do at that point there, I will take it over to the sewing machine and I use a fine monofilament. Usually I love the YLI or a superior monofilament and I will zigzag with a Microtex 60 needle. So it's an ultra fine needle and it controls the monofilament beautifully. And I do a very narrow zigzag over every edge which just holds it down with invisible thread, using the smoke thread on the dark areas and the, the see-through on the, the light areas. Okay. And I do not do the outside edge. I leave a quarter inch all around the outside edge unstitched because I'm gonna cut away that background and be able to mount it and iron it down with the glycifix that is there onto the, um, onto the background I've chosen, the triangles that I've made. Oh, okay. So the white does not stay. You peel the whole thing off. The white doesn't stay around that last quarter inch. I don't iron down the very quarter inch edge. It's okay. still got the paper under it from the wonder under. Oh, so right. I can't accidentally iron it down on that very edge. One tarpaulin. Now let's get on to the face. And one of these is upside down. I've just realised. I'm sorry. Yes, I have too. Don't worry. I often work upside down and there's a reason for that. If you work upside down and you're working from a drawing you've made from the photograph or a tracing you've made from the photograph, then you are not going to think, oh, his mouth doesn't look even. I should have it the same on one side as it is on the other. Because honestly, if you've traced the photograph, it wasn't the same on one side as it is on the other. Mm -hmm. The corrections you usually want to make are not correct corrections. And working upside down stops you doing that. Isn't that interesting? Because I've just been watching um, the Portrait Artist of the Week, which is a, a shorter version of the Portrait Artist of the Year, the UK program. And they're in this um, COVID isolation time doing a weekly one where they get an artist doing a portrait off a camera um, and people can paint and do, do it. And there's getting like two and a half thousand people sending in images every week of their, their portraits and um, the one I just watched actually did. He turned the whole thing upside down and had the same conversation. So um, I obviously left yeah. it upside down deliberately, I guess, maybe yeah. not. So but it's quite interesting to see the stages though. And I've, you can see that I've used prints and I've used dots and I've used leaves and I've used, I don't use just plain fabric. A lot of my fabrics are hand dyes or I sometimes paint fabric with high strike paint, which is, Australian made and I don't, it's just an acrylic fabric paint really. Mm. But it's hard to buy skin colors. They're not fashionable colors. 
they're not even very pretty colours. They're often quite grayed pinks and, and beiges and apricots and oranges. And they're, they're quite ugly colours, skin colours, and I wanted them to look fairly real. But I like the play of the leaves that give you a feeling of stubble on his chin yeah. and sweat. And, yeah, it's quite it's fun doing these. They never look very realistic until you actually do the stitching. Once you start stitching, you can deepen the shadows around eyes and things like that. Have two more progress shots of the face. And yep. I remember um, when I first saw this quilt and you took, it, you took it, me to it at the Sydney Quilt Show and you were so excited because um, you pointed to his filling and you said, I love, <laughs> I love this bit. Can you, can you see this filling? And, um, and the very top of his mouth on his top jaw, on the side where his face is narrowest, away from his ear, yep. you can see the back of his molar, just yep. the very bottom edge of a molar. I was so proud you could see that. I, I, love I was very proud of that bit. <laughs> of, all the, of all the quilt, that's the piece I tend to point out to people and say, wow, look, I got that just right. It looks exactly like the underside of his molar. And there's a little bit of a filling visible. It's great. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay, here is uh, the completed face. There is so much angst in that face. It's yeah. beautiful. And it's not due to the safety pins that were pinned in all around him because I was actually quilting him. He was under the machine and it's extremely hard for me. And I've had this problem with lots of things. You know, when I'm working on faces, you are machine sewing through their eyes. Mm. And there's something that feels incredibly wrong about putting a needle through someone's eye. It's just, and he was screaming at me and I was thinking, I'm so sorry. <laughs> he survived this day. He got out, he's yeah. living in Sudan. He can never ever go back to Egypt. Mm. For an Arab boy, that's in, and he's the eldest son, that's very difficult because he has to support his family from a distance. When his parents get old, he can't look after them. Mm. And it's his duty to look after them. So he's lost a lot by being there that day, but he did not die. He survived the day. Mm -hmm. But honestly, when I was sewing his face, I felt as if he was screaming because I was putting a needle through him. <laughs> it's a magnificent face though, it's great. It's gonna move on also to something quite important, his hands. A lot of people have great difficulties with hands and I believe you actually had a bit of difficulty. I had all sorts of difficulty with his hand because I had drawn it about three times. I was happy with the drawing and I actually finished the applique and then suddenly realised he had six fingers and I knew that probably wasn't right. Not a good look, no. <laughs> so I went back to the photo I had and it was only an A4 photo of the whole thing and I just couldn't see enough detail. So I went back to the, back to the computer. Moss Hub had sent me a very high resolution image of the picture and... I blew up his hand bigger on the screen and took a screenshot of it. And then I blew up the screenshot and took a screenshot of it again. And then I printed that at A4. And that was the moment when, for a start, I could see all the fingers. I could see why I'd got it wrong. Behind his hand on that very black bit of arm that was really in quite a dark area, so it was badly lit, his phone number's written on his arm. And his Arabic phone number was very clear on his arm in the photograph that Mossab had taken. Mm. And I just felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up because he expected to die. Yes. In doing that, it was his parents' phone number, I found out afterwards, because he wanted the phone call to go to his parents so they would know he was dead and be able to bury him. They've got to bury within 24 hours in Islam. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an absolute ruling if they can possibly do it. Then I, re I contacted Mossab and said, his phone number's on his arm. And Mossab said, no, 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 it's not. And I said, Mossab, go and look. And he said, I'm sure it's not. I've blown up the photo for competitions. I'm sure it's not. And then he came back five minutes later saying, oh my God, I can't believe I never saw that. In all the time I've looked at it, I've never noticed. I said, so what shall I do? Shall I use it? Or would that identify him too clearly? And, and Mossab said, look, the Egyptians probably know who he is anyway. Mm. But I changed... I left the first three digits, and the first three digits were an indication of an Egyptian mobile. I left them, but I changed three of the digits in the rest of his the visible number. So they cannot identify his parents, 
mm. by the by the mobile number. Wow. I took the logo off his T-shirt to make him a bit less identifiable. Mm -hmm. So some neighbor wouldn't say, oh, I know that T-shirt, I know who it is. His hair was red. It really was red. And that's quite unusual in Egyptians mm. to have light eyes and red hair. And he did. So here is the nearly finished quilt, un unquilted. Yeah. This is the oh down moment. Mm. I, his head was separate. I made the head. It was like Roman statues used to be made. They would make a set of bodies and then someone could, when their husband died, have the head made and dropped into the body of their choice. Oh. Did you oh, know that? A lot no, of Roman statues, you'll find a headless because they actually were not connected in the first place. They would drop the head into this socket when ready. But I did the same. So you can see I've left a little bit of area of his t-shirt collar, mm -hmm. that, that ridge around the t-shirt, ready to be put on afterwards and cover up the join. I had, there was actually light on his shoulder. That wasn't meant to be a white edge, right. but it is light falling on his shoulder. That gap all around the sides, I had thought he was going to nicely cover the triangles and I had to make more triangles. So there was this, oh darn, I have not finished the triangles. I've got to make more. And I kept having to adjust and make more triangles and make them lower. If I moved him up, then other things showed. And so I had to juggle until I got him just about right. Right. I've also included in the in the flames. Mm. I used a lot of the K facet big florals because I wanted flowers for the dead. The idea of flowers for memorial or gifts of it that were given as a, a thank you for those who died. I I've actually got some florals in the greys as well. I've quilted it with swirling patterns through the greys. So how do you pin a quilt that's that big? when I'm not willing to climb around the floor. You go to the camera quilters rooms and you put four tables together and you tie it all down and clip it and, and spread it and tape it. And I started um, pinning it for the quilting process. Right. Yeah. The finished quilt. Before, That's right. Before it's got its little tag from the Sydney Quilt Show, but it does not have the best of show award winning on it. And no, I took a photo of it. And in fact, I was at the Sydney Quilt Show and I walked down and I found my quilt and it was way down in the very back row. And oh. I thought, oh yes, Sydney hangs it according to the number it's allocated when it arrives, when your entry arrives. So it was way down the back. I was a late entry and, and I went down and looked at it and I thought, oh, well, it's, it, it isn't a major winner or it would be up with the major winners and forgot all, you know, took a photograph of it and went down the back. And I want to add something here because I wanted this to be made as an iconic quilt and I, or an iconic image because when we, when we remember things, we tend to remember them by their images. If you think of Tiananmen Square, most people think of a man standing in front of a tank or a row of tanks. If you think of the Vietnam War, a lot of us immediately come to mind with a, a naked girl running down the road covered in napalm. Those two images became iconic for those events. They were major events, they were both events that went on, well, Tiananmen Square one day, but the Vietnam War went on for a long time. And yet we still hold that one image. And I wanted this to be the image that people would know about Rubber Square simply because they had seen the quilt or maybe seen the article in the New York Times or seen an article by Mossab about it and seen the photograph in the newspaper. But I knew this was a photo that could that would hold in people's memories. Well, it's a magnificent quilt. It, it absolutely, um, I was thrilled when it won Best of Show. I just, um, we all cheered. It was just, um, it was wonderful. And then it had pride of place for the whole period. And, and I believe you stood there in front of the quilt and talked about it. And it was on the news. They gave me a chair in the end. <laughs> That's good. Um, that you had, um, I think you had uh, TV come in and interviewed you for, um, yes. for bits and yes. pieces. And, and in fact, they telephoned Mossab, who's living in Morocco at the moment, mm -hmm. and got permission to run a show of some of his other photographs from his website. Oh, great. He's got a magnificent website. His name is Mossab El Shami, S H A M Y. I will put and that if, in the... Um, if you look under projects, page. you'll find the rubber massacre pictures. Some of them are very confronting. Indeed. That's a warning, yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. So we're back to just you and I. I would just like to thank you for um, giving up your time and giving giving everybody just an in-depth feeling about the quilt, more knowledge. I remember when it was on display in Houston and every time I looked, you had a crowd around you and you were just telling the story over and over again. And I think it's wonderful that you were able to tell the story. I think the quilt is an iconic quilt. I'm sure it's going to end up in a museum or somewhere because it, it yes. really needs to... Um, be kept. It's really wonderful. I'll be putting links to all Jenny's information. Um, Jenny has some amazing quilts. I would like to thank you so much for giving up. My pleasure. And um, I hope you've all enjoyed another quilt story and please subscribe to my channel and like the video and that way I know that it's worth making more because um, there's a lot of beautiful quilts out there. So thank you Jenny. And thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.